we're going to do is uh, some folks have a little bit of a PowerPoint. Some folks are just going to speak for a few minutes. And um, we're going to leave time for questions at the end. Um, first to go will be uh, the, the Dr. Christopher Beal. Um, Dr. Beal uh, has his own practice, um, and he puts into practice a, a lot of the things that we're talking about. So he's absolutely living it every day. Um, he, he's also the chief staff at Sparrow uh, Clinton Hospital. He also serves on the board of directors of Great Lakes Health Connect. Um, he's an advocate for, to his colleagues in information technology, and uh, this part is extremely true. He uh, seems to always be willing to engage and talk and help people with uh, this whole EHR, HIT space. So first we'll hear a little bit from Dr. Beal. Oh, good afternoon. Thank you all for staying to this late hour, and I appreciate your attentive eyes at this point. I have uh, just a great gratitude for being here, and I really want to ask a couple of questions of you. I'd really like to have the effort of the audience to interrupt me. I intentionally left off slides. I know you've seen lots of data. Your brains are probably as tired as mine feels right now. I'd like this to be somewhat interactive. If you have a question, please, if it inspires a spark in your brain at this hour of the day, let's make it part of the dialogue, because I find that's always more valuable. Uh, the second thing is, I want to leave you a little hungry at the end of this. It's getting to be late in the day, but more than that hunger, I want you to be hungry to hear more. One of the things I love as a provider is being able to engage the technology developers. That's really a passion that's been deep into the program, what I've done all along. And what I find is that you need to do more of that. I want you to all reach out to us and involve us in the beta testing. I want you to involve us in protocols. I want you to involve us in the actual testing of the wireframes. As I've had the chance to do that over my career, it's really been amazing to watch where your thumbprint arises. And you can imagine the transformation in my practice has been profound. When you go from a doc that says, oh, why have I got this stupid thing to work with, to go, ooh, that's my thumbprint. I know where that came from. I asked for that improvement. And it's amazing to watch, however, you know, I've been doing this now for almost 10 years in the world of health technology provider relations. That's a different game when I can go to my colleague and say, hey, I know you're frustrated right now, but watch. Let's do that workflow testing. Let's put that into practice. And then let's put it into actual play in our practice and see what it does for data. When I go into my doctor colleagues and say, hey, listen, this is a problem with how you're hitting the keys or not hitting the keys, they go, ah, this stupid program doesn't work like I told you it should. It's so much more beneficial to say, hey, let's look at your data then. If you hit these keys and do this, watch what it does to the outcomes. And that moves their behavior, and that's what I want that to really be. So I think demographics are helpful. Tim gave a brief introduction. I am tech doc 1.2. I like to make that introduction. So I didn't necessarily come out as the first version of health technology provider, but I trained under their wings. When I was doing the early training in my schooling, medical school, when I was doing the residencies, the practices that I was working under were going live with technology. I watched in that timeline four practices go up on, on health information exchange. Well, better more like to say electronic medical records became health records eventually. And that was something that I really made part of what I set out to do. I said, listen, I can't generate paper to have it read by moths. I want to generate information that's valuable to my colleagues. I want it to be there and present before they're actually seen in my colleague's office, and I want it to actually change what's done or not done based on the information that I hand off and what my brain thought was important to give to my colleagues. I ask, I'm asked often, why did I become an internist? And that's what I practice. I practice general internal medicine. And really, to me, a general internist is a, is a hard thing to get your finger on. Somebody asked, well, why don't you, aren't you just a family doctor? I said, well, I'm different than that, right? I had some passions that I couldn't answer in just family medicine, so I became an internist. So that means that I work in the hospital. I'm still seeing my own patients there. I have a big, robust primary care office. We take care of a big swath of the county's uh, a rural practice. I'm in rural Clinton County, just north of here. And then I also have the subacute rehab or the geriatrics population. So those leaving the hospital, leaving acute care setting, are coming under our care. I would tell you that's the most vexing piece of this. I'm given people that are really sick, have been in the hospital or have had big procedures, and then I arrive with a trickle of information. I have a couple of notes. I might have an HMP. I might have a discharge summary. I might have a corrupt med list that represents one-third of the actual data. It doesn't make any wink to what they actually came in on, nor does it represent what they left on or why those changes were made. And then I'm asked to make that call. Well, what's the best thing to do for the next four weeks to keep this person from going back to the hospital? And that's a place that I found was just vexing. I said, this isn't going to be able to continue in what we do in medicine, and you're all on the front lines of changing that. 
Uh, I have an exciting thing. You know, I, I mentioned 10 years of practice, but July the 5th represents my 10th July the 5th in, in private practice. And that's a fun place to be today. People say, why private practice? What in the world would you do there? And I'm like, well, I chose to do that on purpose. That was the design inception. I wanted to be lean. I wanted to be nimble. And I wanted to change at the drop of a hat. And we haven't had to do that. But what I think is interesting is to be Tech Doc 1.2, we've had to do probably seven system resets. We went early on an EMR, we're on the same EMR. I bought one that I knew could migrate with me and adapt with me. But what was impressive is I knew that there would be times where we had to do big quantum changes to that software. And those of you that are in technology, I had to at one point stripe all my data from an Oracle database into a SQL database. And what's crazy is I helped do that, right? As a, as a physician, I actually said, oh, hold on, if we're gonna do that in my office, there's a timeline, there's an agenda, there's testing, and there'll be objectives. And they went, how would you know that as a doctor? And so I, I offer that to you all in the seats that you have for leadership roles, for technology, for administration, and know that there are a crop of physicians coming behind me, the 1.7s, the 2.0 doctors. They think this way. They can't operate without an iPad in front of them. They can't operate without their cell phone turned on and, and broadcasting seven or eight channels live. And what they'll do in that technology excites me. That's why I'm still in this space. Uh, a lot of competing issues, interests and issues come at me. But I'm still in this space because we're building something here that's the, the shoulders for that. So the title of our lecture is what the physicians really need and really want in the world of health technology sharing. And I think that's a big question. You know, I have a, a short agenda I'll give you. And then I should pause at this point and say, have any questions come up yet? Because I like those sparks to be part of the conversation. Hearing none, I tell you, I'm, uh, I'm not delivering sparks. So let's see if we can do that. OK. Uh, so I, I mentioned the fact that we're in all three areas. We really raised our practice to be disruptive in what we did. Now, that sounds funny. Internists are kind of conformist. We like data. We like to see the front chart. We like to see the middle chart. We like to see the back chart. When we've seen those things, we make our decisions about our patients. That's what we do every day. But at the same time, to be able to say, hey, I don't accept the status quo as being all I can have. And so the question is easily answered to me, what did the providers really need in the world of health technology? We need it all, and we need it yesterday. And that sounds hard. Everybody says, oh, I heard that one before. What I think is interesting in our practice is because we are doing general internal medicine population, we ch touch every chart the day before we see the patient in the office. So before our care opportunity arrives, we've looked at every chart. My, f my staff has literally opened the, the covers of that chart and actually reviewed the, the care gaps. They've looked at the outstanding orders. They looked at meds that might need to be refilled. They've actually set up on a full agenda that arrives there for their patient. And we're talking about that, right, Bill? You've heard this stuff already. People are doing that in their practice. But we were doing this five and six years ago because we saw it was a need. And we saw that we couldn't efficiently meet what the patient actually had to do once they arrived in our office in 15 minutes of structured time with us touching the chart cold. And I tell you, it's really fun. Like, people uh, often ask me, well, oh, I hate my EMR. I'm like, oh, my office is my sanctuary. I walk in there, and I'm so protected from the outside world, right? I have all the information I can dream of, anything I can really ask for. I have it. I have it at my fingertips. And I coach the patients. I say, you're coming to me as a first count encounter. I'm going to use this EMR as a diagnostic tool, like I'd use it for lab or like I'd use it for CT. I can gain, glean that information from the other environmental sources, and we can have it here in front of us. And so if I stop and look glazed, don't assume I'm checking my email. Ask me, and I'll tell you what we're doing. I'll turn the screen around and let you see it. But I'll also recite your last four paragraphs. I can multitask. I'm raised that way. This transition to care really is the daily bread and butter. I mean, it's, it's daily bread and water to everything we do. And I tell you that that's what we need for the going forward. I would sure love to have an awareness of what patients, my, my, what providers my patients will be seeing in the next 30 days. That may need to be for my patients an AB pathway. It might not be 30 days for them. It may be 60 days. It may be 90 days, plus or minus 10. And I think there's a customization out there that doesn't exist today. You can get it in vanilla, or you can have it vanilla, or you can have it vanilla. If it doesn't fit your size, you're a nonconformist, so you can't have it that way. And we slap that provider's wrist and say you didn't do it. Now, granted, I'm not one that likes to customize to every doctor's whim, but I think there is some of those things that will need to be optimized when it's right. And we've been very careful how we did that throughout our practice. Portal came up in the last session, and I'm glad it did. I think the portal needs to be one synchronous picture. It can't be 17. It can't be seven, and it has to be one that's valuable. And our patients often have that. They have seven portals. And you know what they do? They ignore that one, and they talk to us. And I say, why are you talking to my portal? She's like, well, because you're responsive. I send you a message, and the next morning out, it comes a response. Nobody else does that for us. So what we did is we made ours viable. We said, listen, you're done getting paper from me. If you get a lab done in this office, you have a study, it's going to be in your portal. It's going to be there 36 hours from when the test is done. If it's not, it's our problem. We didn't deliver on your goods. 
And that's been amazing. At the end of each of our messages, hey, this is your current labs. They're interpreted by your provider. This is what they say. Please respond to tell me that you actually got this. You know what's crazy is six months and three months and nine months later, the patients respond to that and go, hey, I couldn't find a way to get to you, but I sent the response to this. I wanted you to know that I got that test done by the nephrologist, and you were right. It was exactly what you said. To me, that's a win, right? Because now they've chosen to be nonlinear in their communication. They don't need to see me. They knew that if they fired that back at midnight at 7 the next morning, I'd have it read. At 11 the night or 10 at night when I'm reviewing tomorrow's charts, I've got those messages fired out. It's, it, we coach them. It's not linear email. It's not like you'd email your friend. It's not like you'd FaceTime or I am your friend. It's the, the kind of thing where you think of it in the middle of the night, you send it to us, my staff will get that tasked out tomorrow. And so we found it valuable. I think the thing that's lacking too is who do I really need to HIE with? And I think that's going to be the next generation piece is who out there should receive my information, who should be privy to all of this patient's information, who wants to be, and then who needs to have just a fraction of that. I think an awareness of what's being generated by all the specialists is going to help me if I can say, well, I want all the nephrologist information. Anytime they order something, that's relevant to me. I want to have the heart doctor if they check a panel of, of metabolic. And I want to see what their results were on their, their lipids because I have to track that too, and I don't want to order a duplicate test. Those things save money, and we know that that's a, a big loss to the health system today is the redundant testing or duplicate testing or, more importantly, that. I want to know which of the ERs are touching my patients, and I want to know when and why. We're doing that in our office today. We're doing transition to care as a daily task, and I don't have a single person in my office that isn't engaged in that. It's not one person. It's all of us, and that's where it comes. If you touch that patient, they've been in a place where they weren't under our thumb, you're responsible for getting the information back to the chart to make sure we have it accurate, that our, accurate, that our record remains the ultimate authority information. The last thing I wanted to do is I want to pose out to all of you a question. Um, I have a neat charge now where I'm doing some, some more directed time in product management in software development. I love it. But one of the questions I can't get through to the technology guys is we need to build some restore points. So if I'm tech doc 1.7, I've reinvented myself six times. I've had to stop and restart and rebuild and re-go. And I want them not to do that for us. When you build legacy software, we're saying, oh, that's legacy. It's just a known issue and it persists. And I'm like, don't say the word known issue in my office or you're going to get yelled at. Tell me something I don't know. I mean, I know it doesn't work, but tell me how we're going to solve that. Tell me how you're going to reinvent yourself in a way that actually allows it to work better the next time. I got a laugh in the front audience for that one. So. And when people look at me, they give me the most blank expression ever. You don't want to actually format the thing and start over. I'm like, no, no, no. But the way I illustrate it, I say, listen, if you think about Keanu Reeves, his movie, uh, the, he meets the Oracle for the first time, and he is surprised to find the bird lady sitting on a park bench in the middle of this. He goes, oh, you know, the really neat thing is you learned it faster than the six times before you. I'm like, that's it, right? I'm not going to be the first person to have this problem. I'm not going to be the last. And I want to leave a thumbprint in this, the, th the thumbprint that says, ooh, I did something here, that allows that next person to pick it up and make it better. And I think that's what you are all about. That's all my remarks, so I want to ask some questions. Applause, I like that. Question. Oh, that's a great question. So I'm going to say it, and that gives me a, a 30 second lead to think about it. What are the three things we did in our practice that are the most disruptive, and what are we most proud about in that? Well, you know, that's some of that hunger. If you really want to know what that is, come and see it. You're welcome to come to our practice any time. My staff is very deeply, deeply engaged in the level of teaching that you're asking. If you want to see what they do, let them tell you. I recently did that. I mean, I brought a major software vendor to my office, and I said, you guys need to sit with my staff. I'm not going to coach them on what they're going to tell you. I'm not going to tell them what to tell you. I'm going to ask you to just be in their space and let them tell you. And I think that the transition to care piece has been fun. I, the silliest thing is, I, the one thing, I guess, I, transition to care is interesting because I haven't solved it. Nobody's solved it real well. I don't feel like I have any autonomy to be able to dictate this. I have to have a team underneath me and beside me and around me. And, you know, I have people at the hospital that feed us data in an accurate way, and that's really important. I would say that setting up a standing team meeting to let them be in charge of the, the agenda in our office was the, me the second most exciting thing. I backed out. I didn't have to lead it anymore. I was able to participate. And that was valuable, right? They had their own agendas that I didn't really see, and I was able to say, hmm, okay, I can live with that. But you have to live with the consequences, too. It makes them own the project. And then I guess I think the third thing that we've been willing to do in our office, we've been willing to fail. I have a couple of software modules. You know, I have a, a nice core product. It really is state-of-the-art. It is, is, it's a great EMR. 
but I have some modules I haven't fully implemented. They were kind of started with a personality that moved away or left the practice, or I had been pulled off to a new piece. So we're not afraid, afraid, to, f afraid to fail gloriously. And that's okay. I wouldn't say I'm without them, but appreciate the question. Insightful. So um, we're in the era of big data. Big lots data, of da yes. Lots of data, lots of data. So how much, and you're an internist and you love data. So how, how much are you willing to allow systems to interpret and filter and so forth that data, or do you want that to happen, uh, versus um, you want to just continue to see it all, which you probably eventually won't have time to do, but you know. Yeah, okay, that's a great question. So if I can state that back then, just so that I comprehend it. We're in the era of big data. I'm gonna give that a you know, nod to that one. How much data can I stand? How much data can my colleagues stand is I think how I'll answer that. And I think that's a valid question. How much do we want to continue to see? How much do we want to have filtered by the system? And I think that automation is going to become increasingly important. I think that automation needs to be digested to what my colleagues recognize. You know, I think I told you that, that I'll put that data in front of my docs, but I make it very concise. I take away all the flack, I put it in tables, I put it in graphs. And then I'm, I show them trends and I show them value. And I haven't chosen to put them in front of the raw data in every situation. In some situations, yeah, we've done that. But I don't think there'll ever be a day where the individual provider can be expected to synthesize and manage and act on that. I mean, we did in the paper world, right? We just sent it through raw. It just showed up in my inbox. And I had to funnel it out the other direction. Well, now today you talk about big data. You're talking about you know, who actually picked up the scripts that I sent, who picked it up, who didn't, how many prescription pills did they fill in 180 days? Uh, do I care? No, I only care if they're not doing it, right? If it's relevant because it's a warfarin or it's something that has a real clinical implication to me. I think that's the wireframe. I mean, I want you to drive that. I want you to get in touch with my colleagues and I want you to put them in charge of making sure that the, the protocol fits the mandate, right? That the actual outcome fits what the safety net issue has to be. That we're doing it for the folks at most risk with the least technology, but then delivering it in the right time. Did I answer that one okay? It's a big, big question. I saw a couple other hands, and I probably need to hand it off to the next person in my line. I hope we can ask for more questions later. There's one more back there. I'm seeing somebody waving the lights. Kind of have a glare from the uh, 747 that's landing behind us. Uh, I was just curious, a show of hands of how many people in this room understood your matrix reference. Nah, sorry. I figured this audience, I usually get away with that. Some of my physician colleagues, they don't get it. Didn't name it by uh, reference. All right, thank you. Uh, ne next, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Scott Monteith. Um, uh, Dr. Monteith is a graduate from the University of Michigan and uh, Michigan State. He's board certified in psychiatry, a fellow in the American uh, Psychiatric Association, vice president of the Michigan Psychiatric Society, um, clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Family Medicine at Michigan State University. Um, he's worked in a local community mental health center for over 20 years is the lead physician for Trinity Health's Population Behavioral Health. Um, he's also got a, a background in IT. He has an interest for a long time. Uh, he was a CCHIT uh, physician juror. Those of you who don't know what that is, that's okay, but it, it meant he's looked under the hood of these uh, certified EHRs pretty seriously and um, uh, testified before uh, the ONC on meaningful use. Um, he's been in this uh, business a while, and I'll uh, let him tell you more. And, uh, green one? Big green button. Okay, great. Uh, so I kind of broke this down. It's a little awkward, but I, I did it for my own benefit to look at what do doctors really need and want from health information sharing and technology. Of course, it's not monolithic, um, but I'll attempt to at least reflect what I hear a lot and, and what I think. Um, so I am a practicing physician. I still am clinically involved. I've been involved in HIT actually since a medical student in the 80s. Um, I've done a number of different things, including research. Um, in fact, we've done a few papers in the last year relative to um, data privacy and mobile devices and data collection. Um, but ultimately, I, I'm on the one hand very enthusiastic about information technology. I've been digital long before it was cool to be digital. Um, uh, 
but I'm also very pragmatic and I'm realistic. And I'm sometimes contrarian. And I, I'm going to be a little contrarian today, but I'm going to do it as a friend because I want to see you be successful because we need you. Um, the role that you play is critically important. And as I was sitting here, I, I was kind of thinking, um, trying to frame uh, maybe some of what I'd like to try to accomplish. And, and I think that there's a lot of, for lack of a better term, mania associated with health IT. And we've kind of rushed ahead and we're doing a lot of things frenetically, moving in many different directions. And I think we've kind of forgotten about a lot of the basics. Um, so I really want to kind of put a little bit of a spotlight on that. Um, I, I'm doing work in population behavioral health, uh, and, and I teach residents. So I wear multiple hats, and I come to you as an individual who, who is wearing and has wearing multiple hats. I put this slide in because partly it's in every presentation I do, I like it. Um, and uh, it, uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And a message here for me is that we approach this with a lot of humility, that we look at our assumptions and that we recognize that we're often wrong. How many times have we done something and then in retrospect we look back and we say, oh my gosh, did we blow it? Or oh my gosh, did we misunderstand? And it, truly, it, it really is true that the more we learn, the less we know. Um, an example, meaningful use. Really, what a disaster on so many levels. Now, some may argue, well, the only purpose of meaningful use was to incent people to buy uh, digital tech, you know, implement digi digital information systems. Okay, well, if that's the case, then we should have just given the money away and incented people that way. Instead, we attach to that money a thousand page part one, thousand page part two, and perhaps most important is the fact that it's really neither meaningful nor useful. In fact, I have to say that in 2011, I had the pleasure of debating this issue at the American Medical Informatics Association with Ross Koppel, and it really is a credit to my debate partner, Ross, for, for the outcome. But we, we, it was a very fun debate. Every year they have this kind of fun debate. And we debated Chris Lehman, who is CMIO at Johns Hopkins and uh, uh, an MD-PhD biomedical informaticist from RAND. And they had, uh, as they said, the unfortunate position of trying to argue that MU was, on balance, a good thing. And we were arguing that it was, on balance, a problematic thing. Joe Carney, the CMIO at NYU, is the moderator. And at the end, this room filled with um, a large number of people, policy wonks, academics, CMIOs, CIOs, um, they had a little bit of a vote. And it was about nine to one that we had won the debate. Now, it's not a credit to us. It was really the baggage that everybody who came into the room knew that meaning for use was a problem. So please, let's be humble. Let's watch our assumptions. Um, and, and I want to introduce an idea. Many people who, who think about IT um, talk about the fact that it really is a wicked problem. Now, if you're not familiar with the concept, again, check your assumptions at the door and realize that a, a wicked problem is actually a problem that is difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, and I know you can read, but I do want to run through this, contradictory and changing requirements that are often difficult to recognize. The use of wicked here has come, to, has come to denote resistance to resolution rather than evil. Moreover, because of complex interdependencies, the effort to solve one aspect of a wicked problem may reveal or create other problems. This work you are attempting to do is unbelievably difficult. When I, when I testified before the ONC, I likened it to finding a cure for cancer. Please be patient. Be rigorous um, and don't make assumptions that this is easy or something that we can solve very quickly. Um, in fact, I, I recently was part of a team that reviewed uh, an app, a mobile app that incidentally these folks have captured 30 million in venture capital, really a well put together company, very slick presentation. They talked about how they track, they claim, I don't even completely understand how they do it, 700 data points relative to um, behavioral things. And one of the points that I met as we were, uh, that I mentioned as we were assessing this, 
I said, you know, <laughs> how can we consider to do something? Let's ignore the fact that we're not clear about the efficacy or the potential risks of, of dealing with these 700 data points. But I said, we're not even managing ADTs yet. How can we jump ahead to a tool like this? So again, let's, let's kind of take a little lithium here, calm down, and, and, and try to moderate ourselves and, and, and try to move ahead incrementally, rigorously. Um, and frankly, you are going to be more successful. Um, I, I've been saying this for a long time. Your success, you know, th this, this hyper-enthusiasm is going to burn out. I would argue that it already is starting to burn out. And the IT community really needs to do deliverables. They need to stop talking about all the potential and all the wonderment and all of the great things. We need to deliver. Otherwise, we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot because this, this fuel that we've had of assumptions, um, it's going to start to run out. And people are going to say, you know, we've spent $30 billion in taxpayer dollars, and we've spent, depending on how you measure it, arguably hundreds of billions on health IT. What's the return? So be careful. Um, we need this. When we, when we talk about what we need, this is what we need. We need functioning systems. Not this. And this is what we get too often. And I can tell you, this is something, I can't say that we're monolithic, but I can tell you that many clinicians, not just physicians, but nurses and social workers and others will tell you the same story, and I'm sure you've heard it. Um, so again, ultimately, what do we need and want? What you need and want. And it really is captured in the triple aim, right? I mean, we want to improve the patient experience and care. We want to improve the, population, the health of populations. And we want to do it more efficiently uh, in, in, in with respect to costs. Um, so let's think in terms of the three Ps, patients, providers, and payers. Uh, again, we want systems that work. Keep it simple. I'm not sure what the last S means, but let's keep it simple. Um, please, go for three-yard runs. Uh, don't go for Hail Marys. Um, and realize that this is an evolutionary process. Um, walk before you run. Uh, also, I, I really want to emphasize this concept of small data. Um, I'm currently working on a paper on big data in part because I really want to get my head around big data. What is it, all of that? You know, what's its efficacy? Does it work? Where does it work? Um, and I'm talking about big data in healthcare. We know where big data works in, in marketing, and Google works great. It's phenomenal. But we're not that. We're completely different. We have different standards for data quality. We're life critical, safety critical. They are not. Um, uh, so um, let's not race ahead for big data at the expense of small data. We know that small data works. We've been doing it for literally millennia. And most important to an individual um, is really the small data. What do you value as an individual when you're meeting with a clinician? For example, one very important small data point that we often don't include is patient choice. What do you want? We can have wonderful EBM algorithms, but at the end of the day, patient choice may trump that. And I can tell you, we're on the slippery slope right now. When you think about your loved ones, uh, I, I was just dealing with a large clinic where they literally are not, they're discharging patients who aren't taking statins if they have diabetes and aren't following certain algorithms. Is that the kind of healthcare system we really want? Or do we want to support people who make decisions based on their personal circumstances and choice? Big question. So again, big data, great, but let's be careful. We're not sure how to use it yet. Let's approach it with humility. And again, remember, big data in healthcare does not equal big data in business. And if anybody would like to talk about that in a sidebar, I'd love to. Um, also, I want to introduce an idea. Uh, it's a very important idea, and, and I think we often forget about it, and that is the concept of N of 1 clinical trials, or just the concept of an N of 1, again, speaking to small data. Um, one of the, and I can never remember, it was one of the kind of people who coined the whole concept of EBM, talked about the fact that an N of 1 really is the ultimate expression of evidence-based medicine. 
Because really, everybody is different. You can have a wonderful algorithm, but when you add in comorbidities, when you consider the fact that the research may have been based on a completely different population than the patient you're dealing with in terms of gender, age, uh, racial background, you know, any, by any variable, uh, those have limited tools. And so really what a clinician is ultimately should and should be doing is working with that particular patient based on the response to a given medication, et cetera, their values or choices. So again, keep in mind, small data, I would argue at this stage in our evolution, are more important than big data. So clinically, you guys can be stars. There's so much that you can do. Think in terms of unburdening clinicians. Help us do our jobs. Help us out. Don't give us whiz-bang CDS that we all reject because of alert fatigue and, you know, it, 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 you, you, it's just not providing us meaningful data. Help us do our jobs. Um, uh, so uh, interoperability, very important. Um, a lot of good work being done by my hen. Um, simply getting data from point A to point B. I have to tell you, during the course of today, um, I've done a lot of clinical work. Got a lot of work done. And believe it or not, what did I use? Encrypted email and PDFs. Nothing fancy. Remember, medicine is captured in the narrative. It's not ca captured in the fields. Um, there's a lot of technology out there right now that can help us do our job. And I, I leverage it every day. I use a tremendous amount of technology in my work. And again, I got a lot of clinical work done today. Um, so think about how you use data. Um, very important concept. So elephant in the room. Uh, another place you can help us is with healthcare bureaucracy. Um, yeah, so we know it's dysfunctional and excessive. Uh, I, I really want to introduce a concept here. Clinical practice is often standardized throughout the world. I can tell you as a psychiatrist, psychiatrists in New Zealand, Japan, Canada, France, Norway, they're all basically doing the same thing. We're using the same diagnostic manuals, we're using the same treatment algorithms, and more or less, we're basically using the same medications. Yet, they're getting very different outcomes at very different cost. Much of that does not have to do with how we're sharing information or our clinical al algorithms, because frankly, they're the same. It has to do with our bureaucracy. Let's keep that in mind. You guys can help us out a lot. Um, and remember, this predates the ACA. That's not a political commentary on the ACA, um, although there are data that it's worsened post-ACA. In other words, it's not getting better. Probably unrelated to the ACA, maybe not. Doesn't matter, that's not, that's not my um, point either way. Uh, so help us unburden. You know, I, I've done a lot of contract work over the years with, I'm part of a, an ACO, and you know, one of the things I've said is, let's put into our contracts that our formularies have to be at a fixed URL, and that they're committed to whatever is on that URL when we look at it, uh, at that address. Um, so again, you guys can help us. Not sexy, not glamorous. This isn't fancy whiz-bang CDS and a million fields, but this is the stuff we need. Um, so help us to standardize and digitize bureaucratic processes. And think low tech. Wider use of encrypted email, it's awesome. We'll get there, we'll get there someday. But until we do, do that. User interfaces, please, please, please. You know, it, we, I, I work on multiple systems in a day. Am I flying a CRJ or a 747? They're not the same, folks. And, you know, we routinely train our pilots because we know that it's not going to be safe to have a CRJ pilot flying our 747. It doesn't make sense. Nobody would get on the plane. Yet, you know what? We're supposed to be doing this as physicians. And we are doing it, and it's scary. We don't know where to look. We're overlooking things. Help us with this. So again, thoughtful HIT design and implementation, um, improve clinical efficiency, usability, focus on the ROI. Um, at AHIMA, I talked about you know, the fact, and I can say this as a doctor, um, that uh, 
Only physicians are dumb enough business people to spend 80,000 to recoup 44,000. You know, I mean, really. Um, let's think about our ROI and all of this. Let's be humble. Um, and let's learn from others. This is Ross Anderson. If you don't know Ross Anderson, you should Google him. He's one of the most brilliant informatics guys in the world. Uh, he's at Cambridge, um, does amazing work. And I can tell you that the English, in some respects, are further ahead than we are. And, and they've actually done some amazing HIE, HAN work. And you know where they ended up going? Back to the future. What they found to be most effective was a simple letter from one clinician to another using digital technology, not paper, but a simple letter. Not all this whiz-bang, field-based stuff that we're, we're sometimes talking about. Um, you know, think about it. How many pages do we generate during a hospitalization? Why would I ever want a system that's going to provide me, through multiple hospitalizations and multiple outpatient interactions, 4,000 pages of data? Now, I know that down the road, we're going to get it so it's going to be searchable. I'm going to be able to find the needle in a haystack. But we're not there. So again, let's take it one step at a time. So let's avoid irrational exuberance and impatience, trading legibility for legible gibberish, which sadly I think we've done. Let's not shoot from the hip. Let's don't put the cart before the horse. And remember, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. So let's not overdo our digital stuff, OK? Thank you. Um, next, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. James Ryan. Uh, Dr. Ryan is a, a family practitioner. I've, I've been to his practice in Ludington and, and, and watched what some of the things that he's done with the technology, and I've encouraged him to share a little bit uh, with you about that. I think he will go down in infamy for his comments last year, where I, I think the words were something to the effect of, if I have to spend, uh, sorry, using a, a contemporary EHR as a soul-crushing experience, I, I think was uh, a paraphrase at least. So, I'm on fluoxetine please. now, though, yeah. so I'm better. <laughs> All yours. Well, thanks for having me back, Tim. It's super fun to be here with all of you guys. So this, uh, I'm going to show you what, what I want in my practice with my patients and something that I made with my collaborator, Kevin Perdue. Um, he's a field informaticist. I'm going to next. So the take home message that I really wanted to leave is that multimedia recordings can improve patient engagement and can also contribute a lot to population health management and if used properly, can reduce clinicals charting burden. In particular, I want to look at audio recordings and in the encounter setting in, in uh, ambulatory care. So this is where I work up in Ludington, like Tim alluded to. I'm about a block, of, maybe a block and a half away from the lake. My, it's a, I'm a solar provider, it's a PCMH, my wife manages it. We have a front desk and a nurse, and that's it. So we're not subsidized, it's definitely real world medicine. This is the first guy who trained me, he actually had a PhD in physics. He did all of his information management on index cards. He was great. Look at that cadre device, <laughs> it's sick. But after that I, I spent a lot of time as a resident and a med student going through a lot of different clinics and seeing it in an awful lot of different systems. And that was interesting. This is what I was doing before I started medical school, was I was writing multimedia software. And I was performing it around like, the Detroit Electronic Music Festival. And, but that taught me a lot about different data types and, and where they fit in our world. And I think that talking with a lot of health informatics types over the past few years, there's a discomfort in these different media types that we'll overcome eventually. There's a lot of value in them at the same time. I also learned from performing that setting up a show and playing a show is very similar to being in an encounter and as much as there's a lot of information that's presented to you, the state of a current piece, right? You modify that in your performance and then it's done. That's kind of what happens. Someone comes in with a large comorbidity list, right? So what am I going to show you guys? Well, it's a prototype EHR, although that's a horrible world word more of a clinical module that we've been using in my practice for the past 10 plus months. 
got 350 patients in it, 3,000 problems, 750 of which are unique, and 1,000 plus encounters, and 1,000 plus patient-generated changes, and I'll show you what that is in a minute. So Tim said, well, why not use off-the-shelf EHR? Quite frankly, it's not model on clinical workflow. Fundamentally, at its root, it is not. It's great for managing static information, but it doesn't really manage the full breadth and complexity of, of what a human is. Right? It, it, we won't have that accomplished in my lifetime or my grand grandchildren's lifetime, but still, nonetheless, that's why not. I worked uh, on the QI committee in our hospital. I did inpatient management for a good few years with my patients and back up for the community. And I looked at charts on a regular basis and I just saw what the heck, and I'm guilty of this too, this nonsense that we put in, auto-generation, everyone knows about that. And I also worked at our community mental health because we couldn't get enough psychiatrists. There's huge shortage, obviously. And they made their own EHR, and I, that was really cool to, to work with those guys. Um, so if we were going to make an EHR system, what the heck is it going to look like? I mean, if you went back to the beginning and said, here's a computer, here are patients, probably not going to look this ugly, but this is our version of the ugly. All right, and it's just our version, so it is what it is. This is a zoomed out artificial view. It's web-based and it's accessible to patients and to providers. And so if I log in, a patient logs in, or a patient's family member logs in, and again, this is zoomed out, but it's problem-oriented in its core functionality. It's SNOMED-backed, but we don't exclude the opportunity for somebody to name their own problems or even add in non-Western problems, which I think is, is a fundamental workflow shortcoming in a lot of systems. So anyhow, you, you log in, you see your problem list. The red ones are not controlled, the green ones are controlled, defined by either myself or the patient. The next is the goal list. Um, the goals are more kind of a loosely structured phenomenon that we're trying to work on together, and goals can be either added in the context of a problem or independent. And then at the bottom is the task list. This is more discrete stuff like, you know, make sure you get a CBC, because of the anemia, you know, make sure that you ch increase your lisinopril from 20 to whatever, blah, blah, blah. And those, again, are either problem dependent or independent. So if we zoom into a problem, this is what it looks like. So the first thing is collaborative. Both the patient and the physician both have their own note space. Um, it's problem-based, as I already showed, talked about. So images and various multimedia files are organized around problems, and it's curated. So if a patient logs in, or a patient's family member who has access logs in, and makes any changes to any sub-element in a problem, it flips to a not authenticated state. And you can't really see it again, it's zoomed out, but on the main screen it says this is not authenticated, the bottom problem there. And only the provider can authenticate. So when I'm finished see a seeing a patient, what I really should have are two things. I should have an encounter document, right? Some type of something for history and for clinical science that can be shared, and also an updated patient chart. What we're trying to do is allow the clinician to focus on managing the complexity of that particular individual, and a byproduct of that, create an encounter document. So here's what our ugly encounter document looks like at the moment. And this is accessible to both patient and providers. So you log in, you navigate to the encounter, and there's a media feed, it's either audio or video and you hit play, and it goes through, and uh, those yellow bars tells you what action has occurred at that point in time. So, you know, when the provider accesses patient backache, you can go right there. You're more likely going to hear them talk about backache. When the provider added a to-do, you know, get an x-ray of the lumbar spine, right there, right? Um, you can use other audio or video, and when I'm done, I don't actually make a soap note anymore. <laughs> right? That's the craziest thing. I don't chart anymore. And unless you're a doctor who's charted with your kids on the weekend, you don't know the pain. You're smiling. You're, you, right? It's easy. So it's far from perfect, obviously. So if we look at the actions of clinicians and patients as a series of discrete steps in a workflow model, then the value of each step can be measured by how well it supports patient engagement, and contributes to clinical science. I don't know what that extra W, that was probably an auto-generated thing. <laughs> it's like my 13-point review system. Uh, so I'm gonna just give you two short examples of hodgepodge of real patients in the system, and then we're gonna look real quickly at how a 
current generation EHR compares to our workflow for patient engagement and population health. And really, the population health as a recipient of, of data types that can be used for management. So Mr. E, this is an 85-year-old man. He lives alone. He's got 10-plus active problems, including moderate fall risk, early dementia. Um, this man's daughter lives out of state and wants to help. So current EHR, it's great for you know, doing lots of things. It really does a good job for quite a lot of things, I must say. And it's getting better every year. Even the lame EHRs are actually getting a little bit better. But still, it's static in its fundamental architecture. It's not what I really want, at least for me. So this would be an example of a very organized patient encounter. Right? We would go through either the to-do list or the problem. We want everything to be green or at least have some goal or task to move us towards green. All right. What's cool about this patient here is that the patient's daughter listens to the encounters. So she'll go in and say, okay, uh, all right, that's not true. He's saying this, that, or the other thing. And it's also really helpful because she can go in and say, okay, well, dad, you need to change this medication. The doctor told you, and here's why. All right. So she logs in, she sees the same thing. More often than not, patients with this many comorbidities don't really care to access technology, but their kids do. Uh, I'm failing with my technology but here. Um, so that's, that's helpful. And the other thing that's really cool is that in some of these cases, the family members will log in and add actionable and meaningful information within a particular problem. Like the reason dad didn't get new hearing aids is because he can't afford to and he's too proud or he's actually been really lonely and you know, he's telling you that he feels fine, but when I talk to him on the phone, he's not. So uh, again, not everybody's gonna use this type of a, of a system by any means, but when they do choose to use it and they want to engage this way, it can really be pretty helpful. Um, it helps me understand who the heck is this man is in a bit um, more comprehensive fashion. So uh, this is a little dull slide, but to me, it's the most awesome part of what I'm trying to accomplish. So this is 10 years down the road, but anyhow. Supervised machine learning, this is definition, is a task of inferring a function from labeled training data. Our encounters, our uh, humble and feeble attempt, right, are labeled training data. So if you start off your encounter at time zero, you do stuff, you go talk to somebody, you push on their belly, right? you sit down and talk again, you look at their expressions, you're trying to physically do a bunch of stuff and cognitively do a bunch of stuff. Right, so ontological events, and this is used in machine learning as well as in health informatics, are captured in the information management system. Right? Only in as much as they should be providing me with something that helps me on my day in day out basis. But either way, they're coupled at the end of the encounter. So I really want you to think about that with this next patient example. This is Mrs. E. Okay. This is a 35-year-old lady with multiple biopsychosocial problems, and I've got quite a few because I work in a small town, and this is, we don't have specialists like you guys have. You know, she has, she's bipolar, and she has pituitary agenesis with an awful lot of endocrinological phenomena that are managed by an awful lot of specialists. You know, her, and her mother died yesterday, and she comes in with chest pain. All right, this, these things happen. Thank God they don't happen every day, but they do come in to primary care on a routine basis. And a system that can support this and actually get some type of information, I think, is a suboptimal system. So uh, when I walk into that room, I need to be totally ready to connect with this person. I need to be able to put my computer down. I need to be able to give them a hug if they need a hug, right? This is a doctor's office. And I, I need to be physically and mentally entirely for that person. I need to make sure that they're stable enough to even talk about their feelings. I mean, maybe this person actually is having an infarction. I, that's, I need to be totally on my game. We all do in primary care and in pretty much all fields. Engagement starts with giving. You know, we have to give something first. This goes with application design. Any application or any policy that you guys, you have to give something first and then you can ask back. So a current DHR system, it, it, again, it does add value. I know where the correspondence from the various specialists are. I can retrieve them. It's ridiculously difficult to find information often, but say, Levy, I know where to find it, and I'm, I'm used to that, and I don't cry about it too often. So my practice is small. It's just me, like I said, and I know most 
of the patients all the time. This lady comes into our office every day at least once and will call us three or four times a day. And she's half the time she's homeless, she's living with her mother. But one small thing that we've got in every chart is this who I am. It's a free text box, super simple. And it's a collaboratively answered question. Patient can log in and, and add to it. I can log in, whomever, and say, you know, who are you? Do you like ponies? <laughs> Whatever. And this is great. When a med student comes in, that's the first thing they go to. I got that from Dr. Morlock. He was sweet. Lord of, Lord of mercy on him. Um, so in this case, this patient has a couple of unique things, obviously, because she's in small brain. Um, one thing is that through agreements that we have made, she will regularly logs in and goes through her whole problem list and adds an updated sentence to each one. All right? I've only got a few patients who actually do this, and only one of them does it without a carrot. <laughs> the other thing that's kind of cool is her mental health care counselor has access to her chart, and she works about a block and a half away from me because it's a super small town. So I'll go over and sit down with her, and we'll look at the chart together and say, you know, what are you doing for this, and blah, blah, blah. She can kind of keep it in the loop. Um, after the encounter, the patient will go in and write a summary. There's no, the summary field is not on here, just for clarity's sake. So from a patient engagement point of view, I think that it really helps me engage with the patient right, because I ask that who I am question. The encounter and problem review, that pulls the patient in. From a population health point of view, this goes back to the machine learning. Right? And until you start to embrace multimedia file types, and the complexity and richness of information that's therein, it's gonna be hard for you to follow this, but plus you guys who are wondering when we do a you know, med review or depression screening, what the heck are we doing? Are we just clicking some buttons? <laughs> I do sometimes. Heck yes I do, because you shouldn't have made it that way, whoever you are. Like, so he's up there, she's up there. But all right, you can start to learn about what we do. That's, it goes both ways. So what did we learn? This is, I'm almost done. What did we learn from this in our clinic? Safety. It really helps me not miss small blips. All problem-oriented model systems will do this for you. We certainly did not come up with this idea. But it really does help. When you start using a problem-oriented system at its root, it's fantastic when you've got a boatload of problems on the radar. It's, it's great. I mean, ICU paper charts were pretty much problem-oriented, I think, ever since I was around. And, Anyhow, you know, patients like being able to listen. Some do, of course. Some couldn't care less about anything, quite frankly. But, and they like it for all different reasons. I have one patient who just likes to listen to it. It's like a Garrison Keillor show for him or something. I have a patient who's blind, and she really gets value out of it. Her husband will cue it up. I have some other patients who have slight memory issues, slight cognitive issues, and they'll go through and listen to it again. They, they say it makes them feel comfortable. Um, and I'll talk about those who don't here in just a sec. Many people don't care to engage, right? Everyone knows that. But the more ways we open to people to engage, the more likely they are going to do so. So don't just expect that they're going to. Efficiency, charting on complicated, complex counters is simplified. Even if I don't save time sometimes, I save mental energy, and that's huge. If I'm just sitting there clicking buttons and I'm hanging out with the kids, I don't have to think about all the minutia of what they talked about with reference to each sub-problem. It's all done. And that really helps me engage, right? So uh, I, if it's really significant, it goes into the problem in the free text field. If it's not, then it's captured with the audio, and if I need to, and this only happens you know, a couple of times a month, I can go back and access it. So then I can chill out in the room and just be a human being with this person. That's sometimes what you need to do in primary care. Trust, I think it shows to patients, and there's a lot of other people doing stuff like this with open chart notes and everything, that there's nothing to hide. This week I had my second one, so I have to update this, but uh, only one patient, and this is a guy who won't go to CMH because he knows they're all out to get him. So I have to manage his psych meds. He's got multiple comorbidities with substance abuse, homelessness. He said he didn't want to be recorded, and I said fine, and then I told him he had, why, and he said, well, you can do it, and I said, no, no, we won't do it. Then this week another person, Super oppositional individual, just got out from an MI, she's a diabetic, she's floating around between families, she said she didn't want to record, so that was it. I mean, again, it's just a possible module that can be working in our computing system. This doesn't answer all the problems by any means. The negatives, it's a prototype, so it's super ugly, and it's very far from optimized. Next step, 
penultimate slide here. Here he has made it. So we're working with uh, Glenn Elwin. He's out of Dartmouth. He's a patient engagement wizard. He's been writing a lot recently about audio um, access uh, and how patients feel about that. So we've, we're working on a project um, early stages. Next step is integrating discrete reportable data. So all of the reportable information that makes the star numbers bright up, we're putting in as the next part of the machine learning process. It's also going to make it easier for me in my workflow, of course. And, and then we met with Josh, the guy from Smart on Fire. We did a Google Hangout about six weeks ago, and we are hopefully going to complete that in the next couple of years. It's going to take us a while because we've got a super teeny team. So why did I come here today other than the fact that it's been really fun to talk to some really cool people, which is the best part about thank you for coming and inviting me. But it's an open source project. It's not a business. This is something that we just think it has some limited potential, and if anyone feels that it might be interesting, then we'd like to collaborate with them. We've got a couple simple projects that could happen. Uh, we've got a care coordination with a special high needs school in our community. We've talked to CMH, we've talked to the superintendents and all the people in the school department about seeing how this could, could happen, where everyone's ready to go. And also, I think what would be great would be if there was some type of a tool that either the insurance companies could give out or some agencies would give out to us, especially us primary care doctors who are working in small places, and say, look, we can make things a little bit easier for you. All right? We'll take your information in this fashion for your charting, save you time, but we'll get a different type of data. And I, and I fundamentally believe if we do this properly, we can get a very, very different data set. So. That's it. Thank you for, you guys are probably all asleep anyway. So uh, we'll, we have time for a couple questions. And uh, if we get some mics and then address it to the, the doctor you want to address it to or keep it generic and whoever wants to chime in can. Phil. Thank you. Um, so the Lieutenant Governor uh, this morning talked about physical health and behavioral health integration. And that's sort of a big concept. So from an everyday sense, what does it mean to you? And as a community, what do we need to focus on um, to really start improving it? Well, um, you know, I, I'm definitely working in the um, integration space. And it's a great question. And I think we're, we're only now starting to figure out what it means. Um, in some respects, I think we can be agnostic uh, uh, around integrating any provider because ultimately that's what we're going for. It's not a thing unique to behavioral health, but what makes behavioral health unique, of course, primarily stems from the carve out and the long standing tradition of behavioral health being separate from the rest of healthcare. So, very simply, um, I think we need to put behavioral health back into the rest of medicine. Uh, we need to uh, recognize that, and I can tell you from a population point, population point of view, and boy, from a cost point of view, and from a quality of care point of view, many of the patients, even who aren't presenting with behavioral health issues, actually have behavioral health issues, as we know. So there has to be information sharing. Obviously, we need to respect privacy. That's an important element that needs to be balanced and figured out, but I, I'm convinced we can do it. So simply, we need, to, we need to put it together. Absolutely. And a big part of that is putting the information together, but doing it in a way that respects privacy. If I can take a shot at it, I'll say that we don't discriminate one to the other in our office. We practice them as involving one another. They're a truly entwined aspect of our practice. The only differentiation is how we chart them so when we pass it off to insurers, they see it as we're treating health that's acute, but we're, we're balancing those things, right? We're putting that into the integrated care. I don't think there's any other way to treat it. I wish we, I didn't have those physical barriers that exist in medicine that says, well, you're a person that's at risk, you have significant depression, but I can't be involved in what your, uh, your counselor tells you because that would somehow violate your autonomy as a human. We need to, we need to take those barriers out. We need to make it part of what we do. Every aspect needs to be integrated. Yeah, I agree with that entirely because I don't treat depression. Treat the person. Right. <laughs>
Uh, no, but like we were saying, I don't ever treat depression. I treat insomnia, fatigue. Right? I can't build for depression. I can't build for anxiety. And so if you look at the information that comes out of primary care's office, it's going to seem like, well, they're not even doing any. It's like... What? You want to know the most disruptive thing I'm excited about treating? I'm excited about treating obesity as a diagnosis, a billable, codable ICD-10. Dag nabbit. You know why they're obese? Because there's other issues. You don't get to be uh, 440 pounds without some significant disruption to your life. And I can't wait to get a hold of that. So I, I have a question, Tim, if I may. There's the, the Office of the National Coordinator has this um, standards and interoperability work group around enabling a common shared care plan. Is this a, is this a whiz bang thing or is this what you guys want or what is it? Hmm? Ask the question for one more time. I completely missed it. Could you repeat the question because I'm not sure everybody heard it. No, no, not you. Okay, I'll, I'll do it. Is a, the, the, the ONC's sort of uh, integrated care plan thing, yeah. is that a whiz-bang thing, whiz thing or is it something people actually want, you, you know, or doctors actually want? Since I mentioned whiz-bang, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of follow up on that. No, I don't think it is. Um, I, I actually think it's very concrete. I think it's the kind of things that we need. Um, uh, I, I think that there, they may be confounding some issues there, which make it challenging. I, I do think we have to move toward standards, absolutely. I think it's one of the problems. But I don't know that we can wait for that. And what I mean by that is that, unfortunately, one of the biggest impediments now to a, a lot of the things that we want to achieve aren't technical, aren't even policy. The policy folks are on board with us. They're really more business. A lot of people don't want to share their data, or in the case of Epic, they're so big, they're so powerful. They define a lot of that, and, and they're kind of ignoring it. And I'm not getting down on Epic. I'm just using it as an example of where there are so many impediments. So one of my concerns is that we confound those issues, and I'm afraid that a year from now we're going to be talking about the same issue. So let's get on with it. Let's come up with mechanisms for exchanging those core data points. And maybe we need to go to the lowest common denominator. Maybe we need to you know, deal with things like the direct project email. Keep it simple. What's that? Share it all with the patient as the person who carries the care plan. I, you know, I, I, th I think the patient uh, owns the record. They need to have access to the record. Some people are interested. Some people aren't. For those who are interested, we need to be transparent and share and make it available to them. We have time for one more, and then uh, we'll turn folks loose. One more? Well, please uh, help me thank our panelists.